In an age of empire, the pursuit of one man's obsession mirrored the fate of nations. Following the footsteps of the great explorers, a young British army officer, Lieutenant Colonel Stuart Gore Brown, created a colonial paradise in the breathtaking and lonely beauty of Africa. Shiwa was the stately home of his dreams. Its ordered gardens and chambers were to witness the pleasures of a glittering generation, a life of big game hunting and lavish garden parties so removed from faraway England. Shiwa was the setting for the perfect life in the colonies, a gracious home for the white settlers, holding on to a privileged existence that was slowly crumbling before them. And in the shadows of the great house lurked the impending loss of two huge fortunes, the suffering caused by a mother's abandonment of her children and the agony of two brutal murders. For she was children inherited a legacy of grief, debt, and family division, bequeathed to them in the shape of a great house haunted by the passions of their grandfather. The road north from the Zambian capital, Lusaka, runs straight for nearly 500 miles. It's a long and lonely drive, and each hour only reinforces the sense of isolation as you travel deeper into the Central African bush. For Angela Sutton, this is a journey back to the past. She is Stuart Gore Brown's only surviving daughter, now going back to Shiwa, where she grew up. A house she hasn't seen in more than 30 years, a house filled with so many conflicting memories. It was 30 years ago that my father died, and all that year he'd asked me to come back to Shiwa with the children, and I kept saying, you know, oh, next holidays, or this or that. And just recently, I've been thinking about that and regretting that I never came back to see that lonely old man, and also to see the house where I grew up. 18 hours on the road, and Angela's journey ends where it began so many years ago, at the foot of the long drive. And from this distance, her childhood home appears to have changed little. Inside the great house, an unexpected discovery. Hundreds of photographs recording the earliest years of the house. The personal daily diaries of her father, Gore Brown, dating back to 1899. And in one of the upstairs rooms, cans and cans of cinefilm, a visual record of the old house and the family who lived there. A living history spanning the century. The chronicle of a remarkable man living through changing times in pursuit of lost dreams. It all began here at Victoria Falls on the Zambezi River, where the explorer David Livingstone gazed in wonder. Angels in their flight could never have seen such beauty, he wrote, naming the falls after his monarch, who ruled an empire on which the sun never set. At Harrow School, 40 years later, such scenes inspired a shy young schoolboy, Stuart Gore Brown. Even at that age, he was obsessed with Africa, and the idea of building his home there took over his life. He wrote in his diary of 1899, the detailed plan of a house to be built at some future date for S. Gore Brown, Esquire. Gore Brown was to keep a daily diary all his life. Here, in one of the first extracts, he was clearly envious of his fellow Harrovians. 
Why didn't anybody leave me a place? I'm sure I would manage it well, and it would be ripping to own a little land to take an interest in. And it was Africa that was to give him the chance to turn a schoolboy dream into reality. Twelve years later, Gore Brown was now a 28-year-old officer in the Royal Artillery. Gore Brown had traveled far, deep inside northern Rhodesia, walking in the footsteps of Livingston. It was only when he had caught a glimpse of the narrow strip of lake in the distance that the soldier realized he'd found what he'd been searching for all his life. This was to be the setting for the house of his dreams. The local tribe called it Shiwa Ungandu, Lake of the Royal Crocodiles. On Good Friday, 1914, Gore Brown wrote in his diary, First sight of Lake Shiwa and Gandu, the loveliest thing in all of Africa, my own personal paradise. Found a lovely sheltered place for the house, as lovely as anywhere I've ever seen. The local native said the lake was cursed, but he set up his camp by the lakeside anyway. Gore Brown was determined that despite its total isolation, 400 miles from the nearest railway line, this would be the setting for his home. On his way back to England by boat to try and raise money for his project in that summer of 1914, the world was on the brink of war. Gore Brown's timing was remarkable. On the day he arrived back in London, he wrote in his diary, August the 5th, 1914. War declared on Germany. Down to Brooklands, simply cannot believe I haven't been away for a day, and the whole of Europe is ablaze. Before joining his regiment, Gore Brown was staying at Brooklands, the opulent home county's estate of his beloved aunt Ethel Locke King. It's such a perfect, peaceful place, and so far removed from what is happening on the other side of the channel. This was where Gore Brown had spent much of his childhood, and it was Brooklyn's, with its turn-of-the-century formality, its neatly trimmed gardens and terraces, that was to provide the great inspiration for the house he would build in Africa. Gore Brown served with distinction on the Western Front, escaping the slaughter which almost wiped out his generation. Harrow's school alone lost more than 800 old boys. Gore Brown lost his innocence in the trenches, but never his dream of a house by a lake in Africa. He wrote to his adored aunt almost every day from the front. I cannot put on paper the things I would like to say to you. You know you're all the world to me, and I long for you as a husband longs for a wife when they're really one. It was clear that Gore Brown was infatuated with Ethel Locke King. Only seven years older than him, she was a remarkable beauty, and so unlike other women of her generation. She built the first racing car circuit in England. Brooklands became the home of competitive motor racing, and it was Ethel, the compulsive daredevil, who introduced Gore Brown to the thrills of this dangerous sport. The war over, Gore Brown was preparing to return to Africa, desperate that Ethel should leave her husband, Hugh Locke King, and run away with him. But it wasn't to be. Aunt Ethel replied to Gore Brown, one does not commit adultery. Didn't they teach you anything at Harrow, young Stuart? Don't you remember your seventh commandment? One promises to be faithful, and if one is not, one is a liar. Arriving back in Africa in 1920 without Ethel, Gore Brown embarked on an epic journey to reach Shiwa. With him was 22-year-old Charles Austin, who had served under him in his regiment during the war. <laughs> 
They traveled by steamer to Cape Town. By train, their route took them 1,500 miles up through southern Africa to Ndola in northern Rhodesia. Finally, they walked for three weeks through hundreds of miles of thick bush and crocodile-infested rivers to take sight of the crystal waters of Lake Shiwa Ngandu. Building Shiwa was nearly five years, a labor of love for Gore Brown, but exasperating for his colleague. Charles Austin gave up and returned to England, baffled by Gore Brown's wildly ambitious plans to build what amounted to an English country estate in the heart of Africa's wilderness. I think that he felt that Gore Brown was the person who had all the money, obviously would therefore call the shots. My father couldn't see it becoming a financial, financially viable, and he didn't want to be stuck in that place, not able really to have a future for himself. I think he very much felt the, the junior part of the operation. But Gore Brown was undeterred. Obsessed since childhood with carving out a place for himself, he set about the task of building Shiwa with his usual painstaking efficiency. Hiring hundreds of Bemba tribespeople, he laid out the gardens and began work on the main house. He set about building a kiln, turning out the red bricks and roof tiles, teaching himself the difficult task of brick making with help from an army field guide. But from his early efforts, it seemed a miracle Shiwa was ever completed. I'm trying to do too many things I know absolutely nothing about, and that is apt to be worrying. The tiles are breaking before being fired. I'm trying to teach two men how to lay bricks, and the result seems to me very indifferent. He was fair but tough with his workers. He quickly acquired the nickname Chippen Bailey, Bemba for one of Africa's most unpredictable and bad-tempered animals, the rhinoceros. What he finally achieved was miraculous. His plans for Shiwa married the warmth of a Tuscan villa with all the trappings of a grand English country estate. It had a gatehouse, shaded courtyards, a wood-paneled library, and a tower. Gore Brown even built his own ornate private chapel, all set in immaculate terraced lawns and walled rose gardens. It was more than just a house, it became one man's obsession. At one stage, he was the biggest employer in northern Rhodesia, as 1,300 Bemba worked to bring form to his dream. In return, Gore Brown built a village for his workforce. It had its own hospital and resident doctor, its own school. In his eyes, the local Bemba had become estate workers and were housed accordingly in the little workers' cottages modelled on those of the great estates of England and Scotland. I really feel I can do some good here in a way I never could back home, where I am so utterly subordinate. There is so much to teach the black man, and pitching him into the mines isn't the way, nor is making him sing hymns. With Shiwa completed, it was, Gore Brown decided, time to find a wife to share his new home. As a young man, he'd courted Lorna Bosworth at her family estate at Malcolm Bingham in Dorset but he was held back because of his obsession with his beloved Aunt Ethel, and Lorna left to marry a doctor in South Africa, where she later died. Returning to Malcolm Bingham for a family funeral, as the light streamed in through the stained glass windows of the tiny family church, Gore Brown saw a familiar figure in the congregation. She was, he wrote later, the reincarnation of his long dead love. I had to concentrate hard to keep my hymn book from shaking and the words jumping round the page. She had the same all-knowing look of a Madonna in a Renaissance painting. How well I recalled that look. She was Lorna's 17-year-old daughter, also named Lorna. 
I think he thought he'd seen a, a, it was a hallucination, a ghost maybe. And it was only, you know, he was, had to sort of shake himself to, to realize that he actually was looking at a person who was the dead spit of his first love. Lorna was a boarder at Sherbourne School in Dorset. And within a month of their meeting, the shy schoolgirl, nearly 30 years his junior, had accepted his proposal. Gore Brown was a regular visitor to the school during their engagement and immediately clashed with Sherborne's fearsome headmistress, Miss Mulliner. She was old-fashioned to the extreme, even for the 1920s. And Gore Brown would explain how he turned up one day after he'd become engaged to Lorna during a school holiday, saw Miss Mulliner and said, I have come to take my fiancé out to dinner. And Miss Mulliner pulled herself up to her full height and said, I do not have fiancés in my school. Gore Brown apparently said, well, everything's got to start one day, hasn't it? And this has started with you now because you've got my fiancé in the school. I suppose she was intrigued, his stories of the jungle, his military experience, uh, talk about Central Africa and all the rest of it. She had a sense of adventure, all right. She was quite tough. They were married in London at the Society Church of St. George's, Hanover Square, six weeks later, in July 1927. Lorna walked up the aisle resplendent in cream chiffon as Gore Brown's titled friends looked on. Lorna was 19 years old, Gore Brown approaching 50. Purcell's tune and air rang out through the church as they signed the register. Gore Brown kept the announcement of their marriage from the Times folded in his wallet for the rest of his life, as if he couldn't really believe it had all happened. They honeymooned for a week in Venice and then on to holiday in Egypt before sailing to Africa. Throughout the voyage, they were frequently mistaken for father and daughter. The difference in age and attitudes that was to become more obvious when at last they reached Shiwa. This is all a bit of a, a dream. Um, you know, and a dashing young man comes in, or you know, a middle-aged man comes to visit you. Um, and, you know, with talk of this lovely big house he's going to build in Africa and everything else, I think that, you know, she fell in love with the whole idea of Shiwa um, and coming out to Africa and, and, and having the support of this um, father figure. arrival. I think it would be worth spending a few pounds, lest my wife should be so overcome with horror that she demands to be returned to England. Seriously though, a great deal depends on first impressions, don't you think? Gore Brown marked Lorna's arrival by placing the plaque above the front door. They'd been married just three months. Lorna, still in her teens, was now mistress of a 23,000 acre estate, responsible for hundreds of staff but from the start it was a lonely existence. Their nearest European neighbours were three days travel away and Lorna found she was splendid isolation oppressive. At night she would often retire to the tower alone with her violin her music drifting out across the hillside, mingling with the sounds of the African night. It drove Gore Brown to distraction. Lorna's erratic behavior was at odds with Gore Brown's regimented life. 
Days at Shiwa ran to an ordered timetable, Gore Brown's timetable. The first thing he would do would be to have a sort of military inspection of the more senior people working for him. Then he'd go off. He'd probably be out two hours before breakfast. And you would probably find yourself having breakfast not with him or even with his wife, but on your own. Uh, then he would be busy again during the morning. He would relax a little bit in the afternoon. And if one was staying there, he would take you for a walk around the estate and explain things and so on. And in the evening, he would very much enjoy his drink. He was a very modest drinker. Probably only have one drink in the evening and perhaps a couple of glasses of wine at dinner. But he enjoyed it. At first, Lorna immersed herself in the running of the estate. She designed and built leopard traps to protect the livestock savaged by predators. There were always new projects. At one stage, she taught the staff the art of marmalade making, one of the estate's first exports. But these were increasingly lonely years for Lorna. At night, she and Gore Brown would be seated at opposite ends of the beautifully laid dinner table, a separation lit by candlelight that seemed to symbolize the yawning gulf between them. Husband and wife, but so far apart. To be completely honest, I never saw it as a very happy relationship. You know, by the time I could think and sort of see things, they would talk and but I never really saw any of signs of affection between them, or very, very seldom. To provide companionship for his young bride, Gore Brown offered his niece, the newly qualified doctor, Monica Fisher, the job of setting up a hospital on the estate, providing the only medical assistance within four days' walk, working in a country where the witch doctor's practices still held sway. Monica's work among the local tribespeople saved many lives, but her relationship with Lorna quickly ran into difficulties. Alas, Monica and Lorna are having trouble. I think there are undoubtedly faults on both sides. Monica is frightfully bossy, and she is most irritatingly critical of us and all our belongings. Increasingly, Lorna retired to her room, suffering, she said, from stomach cramps. Gore Brown believed it was some sort of nervous depression and his diary recorded her daily absences. Lorna took to her bed not long after my arrival, just done in. Her life is one alternation of energy and knockout, but I don't know what one can do about it, and I have long ceased trying to interfere. This was my mother's room, where she did everything, slept, read her books about plants, played her music, music she was passionately fond of, her violin, any other musical instrument she might have at the time, including lots of bember ones. And she was here a tremendous amount because she was so often ill. I realized I, I didn't know anything much about anorexia nervosa in those days. It wasn't talked about much. And I saw other cases later. But that was obviously what she'd got. And she didn't eat enough, and so she wasn't very strong. I'm not too happy about Lorna. She's not a bit well, and once again seems to be in rather an unbalanced state. She complains about being lonely at Shiwa, but when I suggest she comes away with me, she won't. And there was a note of real desperation in letters to Gore Brown while he was away. I'm rather dreadfully tired now. I cannot control myself at all. I should like to be dead. I'm not a bit cross with you. But I'm glad you're not here, as I'm not a bit nice and very miserable and generally unbearable and loathsome. Lorna was to be denied the son Gore Brown had longed for. She gave birth to two girls, Lorna Catherine and Angela. At one point, taking them back to England to meet the formidable Aunt Ethel. The birth of the two girls gave the great house a new life.
Shewa for a time became a magnet for the cream of English high society, curious for a glimpse of life in this country estate in the middle of Africa. Gore Brown had an airstrip hacked out of the bush less than a mile from the house. It became a frequent stopping point for the Imperial Airways flights to South Africa. Lorna would take little Lorna Catherine down to the strip to welcome the guests. These were Shewa's golden days. The visitor's book filled with the names of the rich and titled. Lady Astor, the Earl of Portsmouth, the Duke and Duchess of Montrose. Lord and Lady Montague of Bewley spent a week at Shewa after the war. Gore Brown, ever the attentive host. It was run with this wonderful meticulous care by its steward. Uh, the servants were told how to wait and the wines were passed the right way around. And the whole thing was a, a little kingdom for him, really. Oh, there'd be a different wine with each course. Uh, we'd, we'd probably have sherry with the soup. Uh, then there would be fish, which we'd have a white wine. There would then be meat, which would probably be venison, because that was what so with which we'd have red wine. And then with um, a, a pudding or a sweet, or whatever you like to call it, there would be a sweet wine. And, of course, a glass of port afterwards. So you'd have five different wines, probably, all together. But no amount of entertaining could disguise the fact that Gore Brown's marriage to Lorna was in trouble. I don't think she knew herself what she wanted to begin with, but then when personable young doctors and people came through and soldiers and so on, there were a lot of visitors and so on, and she did. I suppose she had affairs, I've always assumed she had, but they weren't, they weren't all that obvious on the surface. But I think they must have compensated for what she didn't get from him. Gore Brown, away from home in Lusaka on war work, wrote bitingly, Lorna has been having a pretty busy time, it seems, culminating with a party of 35 South African soldiers to be put up at Shewa last Friday. I know no details, but the colonel rang me up in Lusaka in gratitude, as well he might. I think she really realised she'd married, perhaps unwisely, and also far too soon, and she missed having not been at university. Lorna finally returned to England, and she and Gore Brown were divorced in 1951. Gore Brown was left to bring up the girls with the help of a succession of governesses. He saw Lorna once in Cambridge, years later. She passed him in the street without saying a word. Shewa had never looked so beautiful in the 40s and 50s. The red bricks had begun to mellow with age, and the great house had matured and grown into a home. Well, the trees still look just as big. There's been so much work put into all of those, and wonderful flowers there used to be. But it still looks just as peaceful, and the birds singing. And it's an incredible view, really, from here. It was, and it still is. It's been a desperately busy time, busiest ever. Actually, I never cease being grateful that at nearly 57, retired and all, I have a life that hardly gives me time to turn around. So many of my contemporaries are howling and moaning in inactivity. And there was no more honoured or treasured visitor to the house than Gore Brown's adored Aunt Ethel. She visited Shewa just once when she was in her 80s, going for picnics on the lake. If Gore Brown could have had his wish, Ethel would have been mistress of Shewa, and he was never happier than those few weeks she was with him in the place he loved so much. But Shewa's beauty, with its air of settled calm, could no longer hide the fact that the estate was rapidly going bust. In the 30s, they'd experimented with essential oils used in the manufacture of perfume. The rind of the lime gave up precious oils that at one point fetched seven pounds an ounce, the same price as gold. But with the trees failing and the post-war market price falling, the annual balance sheet showed a steady and apparently irreversible drop into the red. I don't think he stepped back and took a cool look at what he was doing and how ridiculous it was. Uh, 
I'm sure his family have blamed him for this many times since, that he left them with so little money and with the liabilities of such a big place. Shiwa was eating up more than £7,000 a year, about £80,000 today. In the 1950s, Gore Brown wrote in frustration, It's only fair to tell you things are not too good. The final accounts of the year are not ready. Again and again I've said I want to know how we stand at the end of every month, but never do I get even a rough statement of outgoings and income. But it seems that at present the place is costing £7,000 per annum to run. Eric Young, out from England, worked as a state manager in the 50s. He married his wife Margaret there. She was the matron at She Was Hospital. Gore Brown generously hosted the couple's wedding on the front lawns of the house. Predictably, a lavish affair. But as Eric remembers, the estate was already in trouble. If you can imagine She Were um, being in the heart of a native reserve, a very isolated situation, um, we got some sort of money from it, but I gather the estate did not actually pay, and it was subsidized by Sir Stewart from his own fortune. Following the failure of the precious oils, they built up Shewa's cattle herds that all too often continued to fall prey to lions. A woman was brought in from Mukumbuli village, terribly mauled by a lion, probably the fifth lion from there which had jumped on the roof of the hut. It had then killed and eaten her husband, who had come to her rescue, and damaged four or five other people, including two of the woman's children. It had finally been killed by the people with guns and spears. In 1953, this little part of England had cause for celebration. The coronation of Elizabeth II may have been taking place 6,000 miles away in a rainy London, but it didn't stop the festivities at Shewa. Gore Brown planted a tree to mark the event, a reminder of the beginning of a reign that would see this perfect and privileged way of life disappear forever. After the departure of his wife, Gore Brown's eldest daughter, Lorna Catherine, replaced her mother as mistress of Shewa. She hosted the weekend house parties, which were so much a feature of life on this African country estate. And it was at Shewa where she fell in love. Captain John Harvey was a young British army officer, one of so many house guests in those glittering days. But Gore Brown never really got on with his prospective son-in-law. Perhaps no one would have been good enough for Sir Stewart's firstborn. And Harvey found life difficult with Gore Brown. I think he always thought that he married out of his class, which is, is a horrible thing to say, but it's the truth. But despite any perceived ill feeling, the wedding of Lorna Catherine to 26-year-old Major John Harvey in August 1951 was without doubt Northern Rhodesia's social event of the year. The wedding service took place in Shewa's family chapel. The strains of Purcell's Tune and Air drifting out over the Immaculate Gardens, the same music chosen for Gore Brown's own wedding. The vintage champagne had been flown in from France, only the best for Lorna Catherine. The iced three-tiered cake was sent out from Fortnum and Mason. The African staff were not forgotten. They had their sports day, with races, a tug of war, and a gallon of beer for each man. Gore Brown offered his new son-in-law a job on the estate, but drew the line at sharing the house with the Harveys. I do think it would be best to have separate quarters, since especially in Africa, there's always a certain risk in living all mixed up together, of getting on one another's nerves. I've seen plenty of that, and you must also have seen it too. Within a year, the first of four grandchildren for the old man, each christening faithfully filmed on Gore Brown's new cine camera, a new generation for Shewa, and at last a grandson for Gore Brown, already anxious about an heir for his estate. These children were growing up in a black Africa, already emboldened by a wind of change.
Despite Shiwa's ordered sense of peace and tranquility, Northern Rhodesia in the 50s, along with much of colonial Africa, was moving along the road towards independence. Black people took to the streets, campaigning for one man, one vote, clashing with the British colonial authorities. And Sir Stuart championed their rights. Young black political leaders were welcomed at Shiwa. For an elderly English aristocrat living in Africa, this was almost unprecedented. I gave John a note of my own view that with the Congo and Nyasaland going black, we must be prepared to accept something of the same sort here. Gore Brown became a member of Northern Rhodesia's Council in Lusaka, and from here he campaigned for black rule. During a trip back to England, he even broadcast a message to Africans back in the colony. It's the only surviving recording of Gore Brown's voice. These were political views unacceptable to other white settlers. They always had the fear, which of course has now come true, that one day the country would be run by the blacks. That was a great fear. Understandable too, because when I first went out there, they were certainly an enormously long way from being able to run the country. But for black radicals like Kenneth Kaunda, who was to become Zambia's first president, Gore Brown did much to ensure a peaceful path to independence. Sir Stuart Gore Brown contributed towards making it possible for diehard black nationalists like myself to accept that Zambia would have to be non-racial. Zambia would be a place for everybody to live and develop. If I can only leave a beautiful home for the girls and a better country for all my people at Shiwa, then it will all have been worth something. Lieutenant Colonel Sir Stuart Gore Brown died on the 4th of August 1967, preempting his own death and with his usual attention to detail he'd already written instructions for his burial. I wish to be buried wrapped in mats, not in a coffin, at the summit of a hill known as Bareback. He died three years after Zambia gained its independence. His one-time protege, now president, Kenneth Kaunda, ordered a state funeral and flew to Shiwa at the head of a vast government delegation. His daughter, Lorna Catherine, led the mourners at the graveside. The funeral was broadcast to the nation on radio and television. Local chiefs joining the hundreds of estate workers to say their farewells. Contrary to his instructions, he was buried in a coffin atop neighboring Peacock Hill in a simple grave that offered an uninterrupted view of Lake Shiwa Ngandu from where it had all begun. But Shiwa, the great house, the impossible dream, would stalk his family like a white elephant through the generations. Today, Shiwa remains a heavy, masculine house. A brooding place, a house so much the product of its master, Sir Stuart Gore Brown. His presence still permeates the dark corridors that run through the house. Yeah, he was loving in his way. It's only sort of in latter years I've realized, you know, how much he did care for us all. But he just, he couldn't show it. And perhaps that was part of the problem with my mother. And he was sort of, he was distant. Um, you know, we used to go for walks with him, but they were more sort of silent walks. You didn't chat now, like a father would with their children now. <laughs> 
But for the Harvey children, growing up at Shewa was little short of paradise, as Gore Brown's unique home cine film records. When they grew older, the boys had a hunting reserve of tens of thousands of acres. But it was Charlie Harvey, Gore Brown's first grandson, who gave the old man most pride. I shot a crocodile when I was six, and that was actually, you know, there was a great occasion. This thing was ceremonially bone round to him to show, and I was carried on shoulder height to be shown off. But, and that, that, you know, he was very proud of all what the grandchildren did. For the children, there was a seemingly endless procession of the great and the good streaming through the house. But they never forgot the visit of Northern Rhodesia's Governor General. We had the governor come here the one time, and he, for some reason, they painted one of the baths green with enamel paint, and this paint hadn't dried. And at dinner, um, every time the one of the servants, um, staff would go, and serve the dinner, there would be a, a guffaw of laughter or a giggle. And eventually my grandfather got fed up with this and pulled the maitre d' to one side and said, you know, what's, what's going on? He said, well, we, when we went to turn the room down and clean the bath, we found the imprint of the governor's bottom in the bottom of the bath. So they were all imagining the governor sitting there with a green bottom at dinner, and that's, that was, kept them highly amused. And for Angela, there were surprises growing up in this aristocratic environment. Quite late at night, I woke up looking for my governess, of whom I was very fond, and she wasn't in her room, which was next to mine, so I searched the house for her, and I did find her. I found her in bed with one of our guests, and um, she was very composed, and she told me to go back to bed and she'd be with me soon. And the next day I said, well, what were you doing with him? Just kissing him goodnight, she said. And unlike any other colonial home in Africa in the 50s, Gore Brown's grandchildren were brought up in a truly multiracial environment. First of all, I think, you know, it's the, there weren't any other children um, around, so, you know, children all stick together. And so, and we were, it was nothing wrong in our eyes. Um, you know, it wasn't, we found it a bit difficult with other communities who, um, other white children who didn't play with blacks and we thought that rather strange. There was certainly no color bar at Shewa. As Gore Brown had grown older, his African chauffeur, Henry, had become his closest companion. An odd couple and an unusual relationship that stretched over 20 years. Gore Brown took Henry on all his trips to Europe and he features in all his holiday cine film. He even took Henry to the opera at Salzburg. It's, it's the idea of taking an African to a f Salzburg festival is, is wonderful, really. But they, they were inseparable, and uh, uh, it's rather like a little man Friday with him all the time. At the christenings of the grandchildren, it's Henry holding the baby. Once, he was taken to Brooklyn's to meet the redoubtable Aunt Ethel. And they were frequent guests at Greystones, Monica Fisher's home near Indola, where Henry's elevated status raised a few eyebrows. They'd driven a long way and were tired and dusty and so forth, and I wanted Henry to help in the kitchen with the extra work. And he was not really, he preferred to be treated as a guest rather than as a, an additional helping hand. During the 60s, following the death of Gore Brown, John and Lorna Catherine set about reinventing Shewa, struggling hard to turn the estate around and make it pay its way. They began producing timber, felling the towering eucalyptus trees, introducing new farm tools and spending valuable capital to build a timber mill on the estate. They completely restored the old steam tractor that had first arrived on the estate 30 years earlier. New breeds of beef cattle were introduced, sometimes allowed to graze on the front lawns of the house when the lawn mowers had run out of petrol.
but nothing seemed to work. For John Harvey, desperate to escape the shadow of his father-in-law, this was a bitter pill. Like Gore Brown, he'd been an enthusiastic big game hunter and an excellent shot, leading hunting parties and safaris into the bush, looking for the trophy heads that decorated the great house. But as he grew older, he became sickened and disgusted at the increase of poaching that was now wiping out the game, not just on the Shewa estate, but across Africa. An implacable foe of the poaching trade, he campaigned against it throughout Southern Africa. It was this option that was to cost him and his wife, Lorna Catherine, their lives. They were gunned down in as brutal a fashion as the animals they were trying to protect. It was on a Sunday evening. Three armed gunmen walked, broke into the house. The father did a lot of anti-poaching work. And the one theory is that this was connected with... He, the ANC sponsored themselves here for years with, with ivory. It was big money. The people would uh, shoot the elephants and then they would... Uh, the ANC were involved in marketing the ivory and made very big money out of it. Because the people who actually shot them, the two were from the ANC. They had gone in there and they had just shot them dead in, in cold blood. I mean, Lorna was sitting on the couch reading a book and in actual fact the bullet had actually gone right through the book. Well, John was sitting there. He obviously must have made an attempt to stand up, but they must have shot him and he just sort of slumped back into the, into the chair where he was sitting and that was the end of it. So it was really actually a, a terrible thing and of course for David, it was their youngest son, David, who discovered their bodies in the living room. Fortunately for me, rather, the murderers were South Africans. If it had been Zambians, I would have packed up and left because I would have felt it had been betrayed by the people who we lived among. Three men with connections to the ANC, the African National Congress, were arrested and sentenced to death for the murders. At Shewa, they gathered in their hundreds for the funeral service held in the small family chapel. The crowds followed the coffins in the long walk up Peacock Hill to the graveside, the Harvey boys leading the way. Charlie, the eldest son, followed by David, who'd discovered the bodies, and Mark. John Harvey was 67, Lorna Catherine, 63 laid to rest alongside the grave of Stuart Gore Brown. The future of Shewa, in fact the very survival of the estate, now lay in the hands of Gore Brown's three grandsons. The murder of their parents meant that they'd suddenly become the heirs of Shewa. And each had their own plans for the great house. Today, Charlie Harvey raises game for hunting, and if he could have his way, these sable would become the first new breeding herd for Shewa. But it's no longer in his gift, because his father disinherited him after a bitter argument over Shewa's future, as the house once again cast its shadow over this new generation. Mark Harvey, one of Zambia's leading safari guides, would like to see the house restored to its former glory as a private hotel. But the financial backing needed to recreate this magic has always eluded him. David Harvey, the youngest, still works the land, but has finally turned his back on the great house on the hill. I rather view it more as a liability than a, than a blessing. Um, I think Gore Brown chose a very beautiful spot, but um, the house itself is not really, it's not at the moment, I don't think possible to get a, a return on the amount of money that was invested in there. And it may, it, it was one man's dream and has rather become an albatross for us. <laughs>
institutions created by Gore Brown so many years ago remain intact. The local people still worship at the family chapel each Sunday. The hospital built by Gore Brown is still there, providing the only medical treatment for 60 miles. And children still attend the local school. In a continent that is so often turned on its colonial past with such a vengeance, this is a rare legacy. She was beauty remains beguiling. Built with love and care more than 70 years ago, she's coped well with her years. But through the centuries, Shewa has proved an expensive and demanding mistress. She ate up Gore Brown's own investments and disposed of his even larger inheritance bequeathed by Aunt Ethel. She's seen Gore Brown's beloved firstborn Lorna and her husband carried in their coffins to be buried together above the lake. And she's listened to the bickering and arguments over her future that have divided a family through two generations. Today, at the turn of the century, she sits in the African sun, looking out over the lake that shares her name, waiting like an aging dowager for another admirer with another fortune to bring back the music and of those lost years. <laughs>